But before I introduce the speaker, I would like to read, make some comments. And most of the comments that I'll be making are some of the comments that people have heard in the newspapers. We'll start like this. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahmanir Rahim, Maliki Yawmitin, Ya Kana Budwa, Ya Kana Staini, Dina Surat al Mustaqim, Surat al Ladina, and I'm telling you, I'm of the Bali, Walla Dolin Ag. For our non Muslims that are on the platform, because I could see some people, what the Arabic thing that I've read is in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the world, the most gracious, the most merciful. Ye alone do we worship, and unto ye alone we ask for help. Guide us unto the right path, the path of those whom we have shown favor, not of those whom have got, who, have, who have gone astray. Now, the Senate, what is karma? The full meaning, I think all of us, is company and allied matters acts. And the Senate, of the Federal Republic of Algeria in March 2020 passed the, the passes into law, which was which, which, uh, which was sponsored, passed the Kama B, which was sponsored by Senate leader Abdullah Yaya. And in this day of August 24, in a tie, in, a, in an article titled "On Easy Over Section 83 Now of Kama 2020 Law." In the statement issued by the Special Assistant to Camp President, Pastor Adeba Oladeji, the association said it is not against the government fighting corruption, but it completely rejects the idea of bringing the church, which is technically grouped among the NGO under control of the government. He argued that Nigeria should not be compared with any other nation when it comes to, when it comes to relationship between between religious institution and government. According to Khan, in Nigeria, people's religion are tied to their humanity and of course their life, adding that the satanic session of the controversy and ungodly law is section 8391 and 2, which empowers the commission to suspend trustees of an association in this case, the church, and appoint the interim managers to manage the affairs of the association for some given reason. The, it went further to say the church cannot be controlled by the government because of its spiritual responsibilities and obligations. He recalled that during the first time of the president, there was a public hearing conducted by the National Assembly on the non-governmental organization be tagged for acts to provide for the establishment of non-governmental organization regulatory commission for supervision, coordination, and monitoring of non-governmental organization was attended by Khan and many NGOs. At the public hearing, the bill that sought to bring the religious organization and NGOs under the control and influence of government was totally rejected because it was not life out of the church and rank the church as a secular institution under secular control. We thought, that is the current person talking, we thought it was all over until we heard of the karma that was assented to by the president making the rejected bill a law. How can the government sack the trustee of his, or he went for that to say, how can the government sack the trustee of the church, which introduced no dime to establish, how can a secular political minister how can a secular and a political minister be the final authority on the affairs and management of another institution which is not political? For example, how can a non-Christian at the government ministry be the one to determine the running of the church? He went further to say it is an invitation to trouble that the government does not have power to manage. Let the government face the business of providing infrastructure for people. Let them focus on better health provision, food, education, adequate security employment. 
The government should not be busybody in a matter that does not belong to it. The government does not have the technical expertise to run the church of God because it is spiritual. The Christian body added that if government insists on imposing the law on the church, then they have declared war on Christianity and the agenda to destroy the church, which have been spoken against before now, is coming to open more clearly. On its part, Social Economic Rights Accountability Project, SERA, described the signing of Karma 2030 as illegality and has vowed to challenge it in court. Also, the general overseer of the Living Faith Bible Church, Bishop David Oedepo, said the federal government should expand the part of the act that gives the supervising minister to remove the board of trustees of the churches without recourse to court. He said, the church is God's heritage on earth. Molest the wife of somebody, you will see the anger of that person. The church is the bride of Christ. You know how a strong man is when you tamper with his wife. The church is the body of Christ, and we are under obligation to give warnings to wicked rulers so we could free from their blood. In another article, in this day of August 25th, 2022, uh, titled The Church of God Under Karma, Defensible or Dangerous. The author of this article, uh, that is um, Adiola Akeremi, said, For now, the mosque is silent, and the traditional worshippers are unconcerned. It has always been like that with the state and, Niger and, and religion in Nigeria. The church is never silent. Now, in ye ye yesterday, independent of 18th, Friday, 18th September, under another article titled, You Can't Obey UK Law. Okay, it was a tweet, but one of the, um, one of the government uh, uh, people, uh, and it was published in the Independence of 18, that was yesterday, Tama, you can't obey UK law and promote law, 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 lawlessness in Nigeria, presidency tell Oyedepo. The presidency of Monday reacted to comment by founder of Living Faith Church worldwide, Bishop David Oyedepo, who during his Sunday attacked the provision of the Company and Allied Matter Acts, newly signed by the President Muhammad Buhari to regulate financial activities of churches and charity organizations within the country. Reacting to Oredepo's comment, personal assistant to the President Muhammad Buhari on social media, Loretta Onoche, took to a verified Twitter handle to question the clergy's sincerity. This, according to her, is church. Winners Chapel International has been complying with similar law in United Kingdom. Onoche said she was surprised that the post outburst over the, over the new law, urging him to manufacture his own county and live by his own laws if he could not obey the laws of Nigeria. Our tweets read, I hope this is not true. If it is true, Oyedepo will have to manufacture his own country. As long as he lives and operates within the entity called Nigeria, he will live by Nigerian rules and laws. He will, he will do as he is told by the law, enough of lawlessness. She followed up with her tweet on Monday evening to effect that Winners Chapel in the United Kingdom has been abiding with the same law. He now quoted something. Oyedepo Church regulated by the United, by the UK government, Charity Commission, but it promotes lawlessness by bullying the Nigerian government. He now quoted some figures that the World Mission Agency, Winners Chapel International income was 10.2 million, spending 7.7 .7 million, charity and the company, and she tweeted, and she was just showing that the company abides by the same law in UK. So with this uh, prologue, we would now introduce the speaker to us. His name is Barrister Farouk Abbas. He's the managing partner of Abdul Salam Abbas & Co. He specializes in commercial litigation, labor and employment law. 
property law, debt recovery, and alternative dispute resolution, data protection, and family laws. He appears regularly at different levels of the court system in Nigeria, and some of the lawsuits which he has been involved in have been reported in Nigerian Weekly Law Reports, Commercial Law Reports, Nigerian Labor Law Reports, Appellate Court Employment Law Reports, and Law Pavilion Electronic Law Reports. Is an accredited trademark agent of uh, is an accredited trademark agent, a member of Chartered Institute of Arbitration UK, Nigerian branch, Lagos, La then Lagos Court of Arbitration, ICC Court, ICC Young Arbitration Forum, and the Young ICC International Council for Commercial Arbitration. In addition to his commercial litigation practice. Farouk regularly advises several high net worth individuals and companies in transactions involving their business operations. He has also represented numerous clients in the acquisition of real estate in various parts of Lagos State and the registration of title documents at the land registry at San Lagos State and at the Federal Land Registry, Koyin. He's an avid chess player and he enjoys reading the autobiographies and biographies of successful business and political leaders. He is married with children. Uh, I will now, uh, um, so I will hand over to the speaker on the topic that uh, for, the, for today's public lecture series, which is implications of karma law, for religious bodies and NGOs. Please, I'll, I'm handing over the mic to uh, Barista Farouk Abbas to take the floor. So you're welcome. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Assalamu uh, alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to our Muslim Welcome. audience and um, to our non-Muslim audience. Good morning to you all. It's a privilege to be invited by the companion to speak on this um, very interesting topic. And um, although the speaker did not mention uh, how much time I have, I reckon that it shouldn't be less than 30 minutes. No, your time is one hour. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. We excellent. have one hour. And I'll be, giving, I'll be chatting with you to let you know 30 minutes, 15 minutes, five minutes. Then. Oh, excellent. Then the time is more than sufficient for us to do justice to the topic. So once again, I thank the companion for extending this invitation to me. And um, I'm most grateful. So in um, talking about the newcomer that was just signed into um, law by the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, it is important for us to know where it is we're coming from because a lot of people are just coming across Kama for the first time now. And um, some people were not aware of the provisions in the old Kama. And um, based on the new provision in this one, that's why everybody seems to be talking about Kama. So as a, as a form of introduction, the Kama means the Companies and Allied Matters Act, and it's been in existence for over three decades. And um, the, the previous act had about three sections, and the parts A, part B, and part C. The part C is the one that relates to NGOs, religious bodies, civil societies, charities, and all that. So that section is for associations. So if you are a club, if you are a Muslim organization, if you are a church, if you are an association, if you are a um, communal group, you'll be registered under Part C. And the reason why um, Part C, apart from Part C, which covers all these NGOs, Part A and B covers corporate organizations. So Kama is not just for religious organizations, it's for business entities and not for profit um, entities. And um, a lot of people, in, in the summary that um, the speaker, the, in, um, the host gave earlier, is he read some comments of a lot of people on the um, newcomer, people criticizing the sections and saying that why should government regulate us when they don't know anything about the source of income and all that. I want to um, go on the back of that, that the reason why government needs to regulate NGOs or charity organizations is very clear. This is because the NGOs help us to harness our generosity and goodwill for the benefits of members of the public. So what it simply means is that when you say you are registering as an NGO, you, you are saying that you want to fill in the gap that has been created by government um, um, inability to 
cater to some people in the society. So if you are an NGO, maybe you take care of widows, you take care of orphans, you take care of education, health, religion. So what it means is that you are trying to fill in a gap. You are trying to help members of the public. And once you are registered under the law, what it means is that members of the public trust you. So if you are registered under the law, it means you can ask for money from members of the public. So if you say that you take care of married um, um, widows and you are registered with CAC, anybody in London, in America, in Saudi Arabia, they can donate money to you. And another benefit is that when you are registered as an NGO, you don't pay taxes. So whatever money you derive from members of the public, you use it for your objectives. But we have realized in, in time past that some people set up NGOs saying they want to achieve an altruistic purpose. Meanwhile, their main objective is to swindle members of the public or to enrich themselves. Some people even go as far as using it to funnel money to ter terrorist organizations. Because when you see terrorists, they get money from somewhere. Their money can only come through a non-profit organization. When you see some politicians, they launder money through um, NGOs. Some people set up NGOs, they say they are making noise for people taking care of widows and they are not doing anything. And if you, if you do your research and you go online or you go and read reports or some books, a lot of scholars, Professor Smith in America, wrote a well-researched paper on corruption in the, in the civil society. And he talked about Nigeria. So this issue of um, corruption in the civil society is endemic, not only in Nigeria, but across board. In America, in India, in the US, it happens regularly. So it is only a country that doesn't know what it's doing that would not want to pay attention to this critical sector. You might think that because you are the founder of a church or a, or a mosque, you are, you are the Alpha and Omega of that organization, but no. Once you are registered, people see you and place you on a particular pedestal. So government has a duty. The government will be shirking, shirking in its responsibility if it decides not to, not, to, not to regulate this organization. And before I go into the crux of my paper, I'll just give you two examples. Um, in, the, in the article I referred to earlier, the author said that a particular president of Nigeria, the first lady set up an organization which was supposed to be an NGO and that the bulk of the money this organization got was diverted to private pockets. He also made reference, another paper made reference to another NGO which was owned by the governor of the state in the Southeast. She said she was taking care of widows and they did not see any widows she was taking care of. All the money was spent on private pockets. So when you see all this, and we've seen instances in the past where some terrorist organizations, including in Nigeria, get money from foreign bodies. So the idea for government to regulate is to ensure that they protect members of the public. Because most of us who are participating in this, in this webinar donate to our churches, we donate to our mosques, we donate to our NGO. So if we are spending our hard earned income on all these organizations and they are diverting the funds, then the government has to stand to its responsibility by ensuring that it regulates the sector. So in the past, the, the, the Kama of, of old, the old Kama had provisions regulating NGOs, but those provisions were not robust enough. They were antiquated because they had been in existence for several years. And as you all know, we're in new technology era, times keep changing on a daily basis. So if our laws do not change to meet up with the new age of technology, then our laws will, have, will not achieve the purpose for which they are meant for. So it's on the back of this that the federal government and the National Assembly came up with the Kama, the new Kama. Unlike the old Kama, the new Kama has about seven sections. The old one had about three sections. And like I told you earlier, the old Kama for NGOs and not profit organizations, they were under part C. But in the new Kama here, they are under, under part F. And what, what that simply means is that part A, B, C, D, E relates to other sections like businesses, limited companies, um, partnerships, and all that. But part F deals only with, with, with Kama, with um, NGOs, pardon, with NGOs. And part F has several sections. But it is interesting that in the introduction given by the host, he only made reference to section 839, which is the section in which everybody has been complaining about. When I say everybody, I use everybody in quotes. In a particular section of the country, I've been complaining about section 839. But before I go into the innovations in this new camera, I want to let us know that the idea of government taking over an organization 
or proscribing or removing trustees is not new anywhere in the world. In India in 2015, the government of India listed about 42,000 NGOs and they submitted their names to the Financial Intelligence Unit for them to check the source of funding because they felt that the funding of these NGOs were suspicious, suspicious foreign funding. And when they checked this list, they came up with about 8,875 organizations that had to be deleted from the register of NGOs in India. And these organizations included Muslim bodies, Hindu bodies, Christian missionaries, and Sikh organizations. So it wasn't just a particular religion. In America recently, the, organization, the NGO of the president was fined. In the UK, a lot of Nigerian churches have been sanctioned. So the idea of government removing trustees or sanctioning all these um, NGOs is not new. In point of fact, the body that regulates NGOs in the UK is called the Charity Commission. And if you go to the Charity Commission's website, you will see a list of their disciplinary actions against NGOs. When people complain about NGOs, you see their reports. They say this particular NGO did not file its annual returns, did not file its, um, um, did not keep proper account. Therefore, we're finding them. There is transparency. So it's nothing new. What the Nigerian government has done is simply in line with global best practices. And this section 839 that everybody has been complaining about, it's similar to section 876 of the Charities Act 2011 in the UK. So it's not like the Nigerian government or the legislators were so innovative or they were ingenious to come up with a very unique provision. It's a provision that is commonplace and they adopted it for, 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 for Nigerian purposes. So like I said earlier, the Kama has several um, new provisions as it pertains to NGOs. And um, I will go through some of them. And after I talk about the new provisions, I will talk about the criticisms of Kama. And when I say criticisms, I'm not talking about the section 839, my own personal criticisms of what I see that the law did not cover because a one-sided coin is a bad legal tender. There's no perfect law anywhere in the world. If we have a law today, there will be some loopholes. No law covers the Then after I go to criticisms, I'm also going to talk about divergence of opinions on interpretation of the new Kama. And in this section, what I'm going to be talking about is there are some provisions of the Kama that are very clear, but some lawyers, including some senior advocates of Nigeria, have interpreted it in a particular way. But I have seen their own interpretation, and I believe that their interpretation is not correct, and it is not, it's not in line with what the law actually says. So what this means is that even in the provision of karma, which people have not complained about, there are some provisions there that can be interpreted in two different ways, according to some people. But when I show you the divergence, members of the public will, that will decide and agree on which one seems to be correct, whether the, what I'm going to be saying or what other people have said on that. Then when I finish in that section, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about conclusion and what is expected of trustees. What, as a trustee of an organization, what is expected of me? Then finally, I will conclude by saying, what do members of the public want in an incorporated trust trustee? So as a member of the public, you are all on this webinar. When you see a group like the Companion, the Catholic Church, and all these organizations, what do you expect of them? So I'm going to be taking you calmly, and I'm sure when I'm done, we can ask questions, and I'll be happy to take your questions. So on the new, on the new provisions in the camera, that's where I'm going to now. In the old camera, you could set up an organization by having just one trustee. So for example, let's say I want to set up an, an, an Islamic group now. I can just say, Farouk Abbas, I'm the founder, I'm the trustee. I want to propagate Islam across the world and all that. And I'll register it. But under the new camera now, it says that a minimum of two trustees. We must have a minimum of two, trust, two trustees. And when we are registering, the requirement for registering an organization like an NGO or association in the old camera is similar to the one in the new camera. But the, the slight innovation in the new camera is that now electronic means of submission of documents is permissible. Electronic signature is permissible. In the old camera, when you want to register an organization like it, an incorporated trustee or an NGO, you need to submit your document in hard copy to the Corporate Affairs Commission's office, either in, in Lagos or in Abuja or any, other, or any of the other branches. But now you can do that electronically and you can sign documents electronically. So that's a very good, it does a very good um, um, improvement and it's, it's in line with technology. Another, another um, improvement and introduction in the new camera is that now NGOs can be classified. The CAC has the right to classify NGOs. And when I say classify, some of us here have NGOs, maybe um, in our names, in our wife's name, in our children's name. Um, if 
in a family now, the husband has an NGO, the wife has an NGO, and we are both taking care of widows. CAC can say, okay, this particular NGO, we are classifying them as NGO for widows. This one are NGOs for Islam. This ones are NGOs for Christian. So it's classification. The old Kama, we didn't have that form of classification. CAC could not classify. And again, the new Kama also gives CAC the power to regard two NGOs or organizations as one. Give you and I will explain that what I mean by that. And sorry, before I go for that, if I say any association or organization, please pardon my choice of word. What I'm actually referring to are incorporated trustees under Kama. So if you are a parapo, like a group, um, you're a band dance and you are registered under Kama, you are an association. If you are a club or you are a club or you are a resident association, you are registered under incorporated trustees. If you are an Islamic organization, you are in Islamic mission. So when I say organization, I'm referring to all this body or I say association. Please don't be confused when I mention all that. Then CAC can treat two different organizations as one. Because for example, now we have some Muslim organization have an organization to take care of Muslims. That same association, that one, let's use companion for example, we can say we have companion. Then companion can say we want to build mosque now and they can say we have companion Islamic Dawah something. So one has two different organizations that are registered with CAC. CAC can regard the two organizations as one, so long as their trustees are similar. So that's another, another new introduction in the newcomer is that it allows majors of associations, majors of associations. What it simply means is that if we have different associations and have the same objectives, we both want to take care of widows, we want to take care of people from Oshu states, then we can come together and merge so that we can synergize and put our, pull our funds together to achieve success and help members of the public in the old camera, this was not possible. And I think this is a very brilliant innovation in addition to the law. Because for example, now in my family now, I have my own personal NGO and we did an NGO in the name of my father. One of my brothers also has an NGO and we are all working at cross purposes, you know. But if we have the same objectives, we can all decide to merge and come together, pull our resources together and the impact of our NGO will be felt. There's nobody on this, on this webinar that will not have felt the impact of the Red Cross or the impact of Ansar Rudin primary school, secondary school. We all have relatives who attend all these schools. So when you call yourself an NGO, one of the things people expect from you is the impact that you have in the society. And the best way to have an impact is if you identify other NGOs that have similar objectives with its own. There's no point proliferating Islamic organizations, Asalatu organizations, part of my choice of words for non yoruba speakers. We have over 700 Asalatu organizations. If we are all propagating Islam, why can't we all come together? and preach unity, and preach um, the di dictates of the Quran or the Sunnah. So we shouldn't just say uh, Farouk Abbas organization, Mrs. Abbas organization. No, let's come together. So that's the measure that CAC is preaching. And it is something that we should talk about. It is something that we should look into. It is something the companion should also look into and so that we can have more impact in our society. Another, the, another, the, another provision, I, I'm gonna take the provision on section 839 lastly, because that's the most controversial. So I'll go to the other ones before I come to that. That provision is the provision on dormant account. So what this simply means is that the banks in Nigeria now have been given the authority and power to always make a report to CC on any NGO whose, whose um, account has been dormant. So if you are a, an organization, you have an account in Sterling Bank, Polaris Bank, you have 10 different accounts, but you're only operating one and nine of them are dormant. The bank is going to report to CAC. And when CAC receives this report, CAC is going to write a letter to the NGO, asking the NGO to provide evidence of its activities. And if this organization fails to respond within 15 days, CAC has the right to dissolve the association. It is interesting that nobody has been talking about this particular provision, because in my own opinion, I feel that this, 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 this provision is even more draconian, is more controversial than section 839. Because what, they, because what it simply means is that most organizations, including the companion, I'm sure they have more than one bank account. When you have more than one bank account, the tendency is that some of these accounts will be dormant. We won't use them. Maybe we will focus on GTB or some other popular banks. But the ones we have in some new banks or some old banks, we don't use them. So it means is that if you have a dormant account and CAC writes to you to respond, to give them details of the activities within 15 days, and you don't respond because you are all busy. All the men in companion are businessmen, professionals and all that due to busy schedule, we didn't respond to the letter on time. It means that on that basis of failure to respond within 15 days, CAC has the power to dissolve the organization. CAC also has the power to dissolve an organization if 
in trying to reach out to the organization or the members of the trustees, they can't locate you. Because you find that when some organizations register in CAC, they will use their address. Maybe they use an address in Lagos Island. But after six months, they've moved to a new office. A lot of organizations don't go back to CAC to say that CAC, I've changed my address to ECOE. God has blessed us now, so we have moved to ECOE. If CAC goes to your old address and they can't find you, after 15 days, they can also dissolve your organization. So what this simply means is that organizations have to be very, very careful. There's no point having 10 bank accounts, opening accounts in all the banks in Nigeria, and you're only running one account. If you have 10 accounts and you're only running two, go and close the remaining eight accounts. Because if your accounts are dormant, it is, it is a gateway to eventual dissolution by CAC. So that's a brilliant provision. And this provision is section 842 of the new Kama. So let us, let, us, let us note that provision and let us be aware of what it says. Another, another provision, another provision in, in the new Kama is that um, associations now have to file by annual statement of affairs. And what they mean by, by annual statement of affairs is a statement of affairs talking about your organization. What have you been up to? How much have you made? Um, have you changed your trustees? Have you changed your address? Have you acquired any property and all those things? You have to file it with CAC by annually, twice. And um, when you don't file this report to CAC, it is the trustees that will be paying fine for every day of default. So CAC did not say it is the NGO or it's the association. They said it is the trustees. So if somebody invites you and say, Alaji, please come and be a trustee in our organization and you accept, what it simply means is that by accepting, if the organization fails to file the reports to CAC, you'll be paying fine on a daily basis. And the CAC, the new, this new CAC, the new CAMA gives CAC the power to issue a, a guide, like a regulation. And what regulation simply does is that regulation will explain further. So for example, this section says you should file your returns twice in a year. The regulation will explain how you should file it, what it should contain and all that. But as of now, CAC is yet to issue the regulation. I'm sure they are still working on it. And once the regulation is issued, it will be important for us to also comply with, the, with this provision. And another interesting, interesting provision in the Kama is that the Kama establishes a committee known as the Administrative Proceedings Committee, also known as the APC, not the Political Party, Administrative Proceedings Committee. And this, this committee was established in Section 851 of Kama. And the, uh, the committee, the duty of the committee is um, to, to hear, to hear um, persons who have been alleged to contravene the provisions of Kama. So if you have contravened the provision of Kama, it's like a quasi court. You can go there to complain about what is happening, what has been, what, what, what has been happening in your NGO. They can resolve disputes amongst um, members of um, the NGO and all that. And they can also impose administrative penalties for contravention of the provisions of the NGO. So if as an NGO or as an association, you have contravened the provisions of, of, of Kama, this APC, would, um, would um, issue a penalty upon you and you will be obliged to pay. And um, if, you, if you are not satisfied with, with, the provision, with the ruling of the APC, you are allowed to appeal to the Federal High Court. And if you appeal to the Federal High Court, if you are not satisfied, you can also go all the way to the Supreme Court. And um, another interesting provision, which a lot of people don't always take note of in the new Kama, is that Section 836 says that an NGO or an organization can set up a governing council or governing body. In most cases, we call this body executive council. But a provision that the section says is that this governing council shall include trustees. It didn't say may. It didn't say might. It said shall include. So what this means is that when we are having a governing council, our trustees should be included in the governing council. And the reason for this provision is simple. Whenever an association organization is dealing with CAC, or you're corresponding with CAC, CAC will not recognize the governing council, the Amir of Companion, or the chairman of Companion. CAC does not recognize that. It's your board of trustees that CAC has a relationship with, because they are the ones that their names are in the record in CAC. So the idea of having some of your trustees as part of your governing council is that if the governing council is erring, or is, 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 is very enough the objective of the organization, the members of the trustee who are on the governing council can call them to order. Because if the NGO is going to be sanctioned, it is the trustees that will be sanctioned in their personal capacity. So any trustee who decides not to be active in an organization that he or she belongs to 
is only exposing his or herself to sanctions from CAC. And um, another, another interesting provision in the newcomer as, as it pertains to associations is that every association shall not later than 30th of June or 31st of December of any given year submit a return to CAC showing the name of the association, the names of the, the, the address and occupations of the trustees, the members of the governing council, and particulars of any land held by the corporate body during the year. And if they've made any changes in their constitution during the year, they should also put that in their, in their, in their returns to CAC. And aside from filing that returns to CAC, they are also obliged to submit an audited statement of account of the year of return to CAC. So what this simply means is that you can't say because you're an NGO and then um, you don't get so much money from the public, like some other organization, you're not going to file audit testament of account. You have a duty as an NGO to submit your audit testament of account to CAC. And your audit testament of account must contain all the income you received under the given year, how you spent the money, what you spent the money on for every given year. So it is a duty. And the issue of landed property, a lot of associations file returns to CAC and they don't include landed property that they own. Now they are obliged to do so. If you don't do so, you'll be exposing yourself to sanctions by CAC. And um, yes, to the, to the big fish in the lot of um, introduction or uh, amendments to the law, section 839, that's the most controversial section of KAMA. So um, section 839, um, as you are all aware, has um, 11 subsections. We have section 8391, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But um, the one people have been talking about the most is section 8391. And what section 8391 simply says is that um, CAC can suspend the trustees of an association and appoint interim managers to take, to take over the affairs of the organization where there has been misconduct or mismanagement in the administration of the association, number one, where it is necessary to prote protect the, the property of the association. So for example, people are trying to sell the property of the association or they are trying to divert it and all that, CAC can intervene to protect the property of the association. It is also important, they can also intervene where there has been fraud. So if you see, if anybody has committed fraud or the trustees or the ESCO, they can, they can also take over the association or remove the trustees or where it is in the interest of the public, public interest, they can take over. So one, one important thing on this section 8391 that I've just explained is that it says that the CAC may by order suspend a trustee or appoint an interim manager. But in section 8392, it says that CAC requires the order of the courts by going to court upon the petition of the commission or upon the petition of 20% of the members. So the interesting thing here now is that section sub, subsection one says that CAC may by order remove a trustee or appoint an interim, interim manager. But section sub, subsection two says that they must go to the court. In my own view, section subsection one and two are disjunctive. They are not co-joined, they are not together. So what that means simply is that, number one is that CAC on its own, once they investigate and they see that this so, these four issues we've talked about to protect the association, there is misconduct or mismanagement or there is fraud or there is public interest. Once CAC makes that determination on its own, CAC can remove a trustee without going to the courts. Because it says CAC may by order. It didn't say CAC may by order of courts. As I mean, it says CAC may by order of court, then we can say CAC can't act alone without the court. But in subsection two, it says that the trustees, the trustees suspended, the trustees shall be suspended by an order of court. So what this simply means is that CAC has two options. Where there is an issue regarding an organization, they can decide to act on their own or they can decide to go to the court. So that's very important and that's very interesting. Some people have interpreted these sections to mean that when the section one says that CAC may by order, what the lawmakers were referring to in that section is they may by order of courts. But I am saying that that's not the correct interpretation because 
by order is very clear. A rule of interpretation is that what is not included in a law cannot be read into it. If the lawmakers put CAC can go to court in subsection two and they wrote court there, the mere fact that they didn't put it in subsection one means that they know what they are doing. They deliberately wanted to give CAC that power. So some people have been arguing and some very popular pastors have been saying CAC will take over my organization. Maybe the Registrar General of CAC is a Muslim and all those things. But the truth is that this same act says that CAC cannot act on its own. The board of CAC must support any action that the Registrar General of CAC takes. Aside from that, the Minister of Trade must sanction any action of CAC. And again, if you are not satisfied with the, whatever CAC does, you can go to court or you can go to the APC, the Administrative Proceedings Committee, to complain about the action of the Registrar General. So the section is not as draconian as what people are making of it. So CAC has to look at all those four aspects. And whenever those four aspects come up, they would take action and they will give you fair hearing. So if they say you have committed fraud in your organization, they will invite you and they will confront you with their documents, their evidence of fraud. If you know you have not committed any fraud, then if your hands are clean, they will leave you. And another important provision in subsection two here is that the C section 839 subsection two says that 20% of the members of an organization can write a petition to CAC for CAC to remove the trustees of an organization. But the issue now is some people are saying that the 20% is not 20% of members. It is 20% of trustees. Because if you say 20% of members of an organization, like a church now, they have hundreds of thousands of members. That's so it is not realistic. But my own position is that the law is very clear. The law says one fifth of members of the organization, of the association. So when it says members, members is different from trustees. Member is a different word from trustee. So what this simply means is that this section has put an obligation on organizations to be transparent with their register of members. Because if I say as a member of Companion, I want to mobilize 20% of our members to write a petition against the Companion, how do I know 20% of our members when I don't have access to the register of members? So indirectly, the law has given us something on one hand and they've taken, it has taken it away on the other hand. Because if as members, we don't know our register, how do we challenge? If I challenge and I say we are 20%, the companion can say, no, we are not 20%. As at Friday, maybe I filed my petition to CAC on 1st of January, 2020. And companion had 200 members. 20% 20 of 200 members should be 40 members. And I say, we are 40 members. We have signed this petition. We want you to investigate the companion. But the companion can respond and say, as at 1st of January, 2020, our members, we were 270. Therefore, you have not complied. If I comply again, they can change it again. So there is a duty on associations to be transparent in their register of members. Because if they are not transparent, then nobody will be able to petition CAC against an organization. I mean, I belong to several organizations. The estate where I live, they consulted me on two occasions on litigation matters regarding the management of the association. Where my office is as well, we've had issues with the association. So it's, it's commonplace. It's not just churches and mosques. As small as all these organizations are, they want to do elections and they are going to court. They are changing the constitution. They are not following the procedure of their constitution. They are embezzling funds. They are not managing funds very well. So when we talk about corruption in the government circle and co corruption in the private circle, corruption in the, in, the, in, in the associations is also endemic. And in some cases, it's even more than corruption in government circle. So organizations, including the companion, have to be transparent with their list of members. We can have a website, or we can see the list of members, so that if anybody wants to complain, they can mobilize 20% and do this. And what this also means is that once all these organizations are aware that 20% of our members can write a petition against us to CAC, they will sit up. They will sit up. And um, I, must, I must say, in the introduction, when the host was speaking, he said most of the people that were complaining about the newcomer are Christians. They were Christians, that Muslims, we're not complaining. Imams were not complaining. And I think the only logical explanation for that is because perhaps um, our mosques are not as financially buoyant as um, our churches. And even if they are financially buoyant, I'm not aware of any imam who has one private jet or two private jets. So I believe that it is correct that we're not as buoyant. And when we're not as buoyant, what does that mean? What does that tell us? That simply tells us that if your members or members of the public 
believe that you are transparent in the management of your resources, they will give you more money. So if as a Muslim organization, we are extremely transparent, we comply with the law, we let members of the public know that in 2020, we raised 10 million naira. Out of the 10 million naira, we spent 9.5 million naira on our objectives by helping members of the public. But we only spent 500,000 naira on administrative costs. Then they will believe in us. They will be able to give us more money. But if we send money to our organizations and they don't tell us how they spend the, the money, we are not going to be encouraged to give more money. We're not going to be encouraged. So if we are transparent and we let them know how we are spending the money, some people raise money and they spend the bulk of that money on administrative costs. Hotel for our general overseer, for our Amir. Hotel costs, you raise 10 million in a year. Hotel costs for Amir is 7 million naira. Logistics is 1 million naira. Then the money that used to help members of the public is 200,000 naira. You know, when you have that, people will not, will, not, will, not, will not donate money to you. So when we are transparent, people will give us more money. Transparency helps to ensure that more funds are raised. So it is very important that um, we, 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 we allow our list of members to be known. We are transparent in the way we spend money. And we ensure that the bulk of our funds are disbursed on our objectives. So that's, uh, that's, um, that's my position on that um, section 839. And, um, so 30 minutes more. OK, thank you very much. So I'm, I'll move to my next section now, which is criticisms of the act. So when I say criticism, you know, one of the provisions, let me put it one of the provisions, um, one of the provisions, one of the grounds on which CAC can remove a trustee is in the interest of public interest. But interestingly, the camera did not define what public interest is. And you know, in Nigeria, our Nigerian government officials and politicians, they like nebulous terms. They like ambiguous terms because they can play, they can ride the nebulous terms like a donkey and they can use it to suit their purposes. So when you say public interest, you can take over, you can remove a trustee on the ground of public interest. What is public interest? Public interest in the act was not defined. And when you don't define a term, what it means is that this term can be abused. If the Registrar General of CAC is not happy with an organization, it can say in the, it's, it's in the interest of public because you abuse the president or you criticize the policy of the president, then I'll go to your association and go and remove you as a trustee because it's in the interest of the public. So when you have something that is not defined, it can be abused. It would have helped if public interest had been defined, although I concede that it is not possible to have an exhaustive list of what amounts to public interest. But if the act had given us guidance as to what comprises called public interest, we will have known how to act. So the law did not define public interest, and this is subject to abuse. And I'll give you an interesting provision. The Land Use Act says that the governor of a state can take over a parcel of land in the interest of the public, overriding interest of the public. And we have seen instances in the past where a governor takes over a land for public interest and gives that land to a private person. But when the private person challenged the, the, the revocation of his land in court, the court held that, yes, the governor was wrong, that this is not public interest. You can't collect a land and give it to a developer and you say it's public interest. Public interest is when you use the land for, for general hospital or for LOMA or for something that everybody, members of the public will benefit from. So this, the fact that public interest was not defined is a major lacuna in this law. And it is something that we hope that in the future, our lawmakers can shed more light on. Another, another lacuna in the law, in my opinion, is that section 839 says that the CAC can appoint an interim manager to take over an association. But the point is that the CAC did not define the qualities of the interim manager, the characteristics of the interim manager, the qualification of the interim manager. What if a trustee in my association is an allergy? He has gone to Mecca 10 times. He fasts Monday and Thursday. He's always praying and doing tarjud. Then you now remove him from CAC. You CAC removes him as a trustee. Then you now bring somebody to, as a trustee that does not, does not even know how to read Fatia or does not even know how to pray. Would that achieve any purpose? But in the UK, the UK, the Charity Commission of the UK has a list of accredited members from where they choose their interim managers. So in, CA, in UK, they have a list that says that, okay, if this is for religion, this is it. These are our experts. If this is for public interest, if this is, you know, they have a list of accredited accredited, um, accredited um, interim managers. And the pastors that complained about taking over their churches, they have a valid point on this in this regard. Because I mean, if, um, 
I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, let's say I'm a, I'm a church that we don't watch television. We don't believe in social media. We are, we don't even wear, we don't wear color. We only wear white clothes and all that. Then you remove my trustee. Then you're not going to bring a trustee that is an allergy. The law as it is now allows that. CAC can remove a trustee who is a pastor and put an allergy there because the law did not define who the interim manager should be and what are the qualifications. But I believe that in the regulation CAC is working on, because CAC will issue a regulation post one to this law. I'm sure that in the regulation, they will talk about interim managers and say that if we are removing an, an, a trustee for an Igbo organization, we are going to make sure that the interim manager is not a Yoruba man or an Awusa man. If we are removing a trustee in a Christian association, the new trustee will not be a Muslim, it will be a fellow Christian. And it will be of the same denomination, not a different denomination. So that's my second um, criticisms, criticism on the law. And um, another criticism I have of the law, which is a lacuna, is that the law did not make it mandatory for associations to have a list of members that will be accessible to members of the organization and members of the public. I would have loved it if the law had a provision saying that all organizations should have a register of members that will be open to all members of that organization at every point in time, either electronically or physically, meaning that if I'm a member of the companion, I should be able to call the secretary of companion and say, sir, I want to come to the office to have of members. Who are they? I want to have access to them. I'm a member of the MBA. When we were going to vote, we saw all the list of lawyers who are accredited to vote. We saw the names of our members, of our lawyers. So if we are running an NGO, let us know who our members are. What if we have a member that has been convicted or a member who is a terrorist or who is on the wanted list? Are we not going to be able to sanitize our list? So CSC should have made it mandatory for all organizations to make their list of membership accessible to their members and members of the public. Because by not doing so, these organizations will continue to hide their list of members. They will continue to hide their list of members and members will not be able to petition against them. So that is another major lacuna that I think should be addressed. Another major lacuna that I think should be addressed in the law is that the camera says that organizations should file their annual returns, file all the type of statement of account on a yearly basis and all that. But it says that where they don't file it as at when due, they will pay penalty. And we know in Nigeria, majority of comp companies and organizations that are registered with CAC, they don't file annual returns. The only time they file annual returns is maybe they want to remove a trustee. And, or they want to remove a director. And when you want to remove a director, before you can do a post incorporation filing, your filing at CAC must be up to date. So you see some associations, since they've incorporated them in 1952 or 1963, they've not filed any annual returns. Meanwhile, you are preaching your religion. You are preaching the Quran, you are preaching the Bible. How can you be preaching the Quran and Bible and you are not complying with the law of the land? So it's a duty. We have a moral and legal duty to do this. But my problem I now have with the law is that the law only says that when you don't file these things, you can pay a penalty. That's not, that's not enough sanction. Because in the old karma, we had that provision to pay penalty. And people were flouting these, these rules, these rules, these regulations. All the organizations were not filing their annual returns. And when they want to file after 10 years, they will pay penalty. But in, in the UK, if you don't file your account as at when due, the Charity Commission can investigate you. If you go to the, UK, the Charity Commission's website now, you will see their report where they've sanctioned some organizations that did not file their accounts as at when due. So CAC should have made it more stringent. For example, putting a disciplinary measure on the trustees that if you are an organization and you don't file your account at the end of this year, we are going to discipline, sanction the trustee, not just payment of fine. Or even if they are going to pay fine, the fine should be very steep. It should be a high figure that would discourage them from not filing their annual returns. So as it is now, the provision of karma as it relates to annual returns is not a strong provision. A lot of organizations don't have incentive to file. Because if they don't file, what's, what's the worst thing that will happen? I'll pay penalty. How much is the penalty? So hopefully, if the regulation comes out and stipulates the penalty to be very, very high, let's say one million naira per organization that don't file, that don't file in a year, or they should sanction the trustees so that if the trustee wants to contest for election as governor of a state or wants to be a director of a public company, they can easily do a due diligence and say that this person has been sanctioned by CAC. Because as a trustee of an Asalatu, it did not file annual returns. It did not ensure that it's going to file annual returns. So if I make him a director of Guarantee Trust Bank, how am I sure he's going to wake up to his responsibilities as a director? So those are my major criticisms of, 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 of the law. Then now I'm going to talk about, the next session I'm going to is divergence of opinion. 
on the interpretation of karma. I've, 15 I've, I've, minutes more. 15 minutes more. Okay, 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 okay. No, okay. So since I have 15 minutes more, let me let me skip that section. Let me go to the primary role of trustees because I know that some people listening to us here are trustees. If you are a trustee of an NGO, your primary role is to ensure that the organization complies with the provisions of karma. So you are on this platform now. You've heard all what I've said. If you are a trustee of Ijesha Union, Abaraka Emad, an Anambra Union, or Salatu, or any of us are Salatu, go and meet with them, meet with the GEO or the Amir, call them and say, please, pardon my choice of words, Emad Bamiloru Koje, comply with this provision of the law. So as a trustee, if you tell them and they don't comply, put it in writing, send them an email, send them a letter, so that whenever CAC investigates them and finds them culpable, they won't mention your name that are ah, Alaji XYZ is a trustee and they did not file an returns for the past 10 years and they are collecting money from Saudi Arabia and from Iran and they are not declaring anything. So you have to put it in writing and ensure that they comply with the law. Another obligation on the trustees is that section 846 of Kama says that the trustees shall ensure that the accounting records of the association are kept and the accounts shall be detailed. Please note it very well. The section Kama did not say the, the general overseer or the Amir or the president or the chairman. It says the trustees shall ensure that the accounts of the, of the organization are kept. So if the president of the association has not done the account, as a trustee, you have a bounding duty to ensure that he prepares the account. And if he doesn't prepare the account, create your paper trail, write a letter against him, write to CAC, so that when they come and investigate you, they don't, they don't tie your, your unblemished reputation. Another, 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 another obligation of the trustee is that Kama says that the trustees of the association shall not earlier than 30th of June or later than 31st of December submit to the CAC a return showing the name of the association, the address and occupation of the trustees, the members of the governing council, and particulars of any land held by the corporate body during the year or any change that are taking place in the constitution. So this means that if you are a trustee of an association and the, the association has land in Banana Island and they have in Ikoi, but when you are filing your returns to CAC, you only want to mention the land in Yanopada. I like don't want government to know that uh, you have a lot of money. Then that's an infraction. That means you have made a false return to CAC. And when you have made a false return, it's the trustee that will be punished because the law did not say the NGO or the daddy geo should submit accounts. It says the trustees. So ask your trustees, the NGO, the geo, the geo, daddy geo, the Amir, ask them the land that we bought in Victoria Island. Have you told CAC that we have land in Victoria Island? Have you told them that we have land in Banana Island? So you must ensure. So trustee is not something that you just put on your CV, that I'm a trustee of this NGO. I'm a trustee, I'm a founder of this NGO. Trusteeship comes with a lot of responsibilities. So um, without, without, because I, I want to keep to time, I don't want to talk too much, without um, belaboring the issue, I hope that I've been able to summarize the key points of um, the newcomer. I'll be happy to take questions. And if I've not shared any light on one or two provisions, please feel free to call my attention to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. May Allah continue to increase in knowledge. Uh, this is a very coincise um, lecture and you have exposed a lot of things that most of us do not know and that uh, may Allah continue to be with you. Jazakumullah khairan for that. Now, what we'll do before question, we have some comments we have some questions, but before we take those comments and questions, we have some announcement. Like we said during our conference, that uh, there are certain things we'll be doing now. Part of it is that um, on the 26th of September, we are going to have training for our members. The training is tagged Tools of Digital Marketing. That will be 26th of September. But anybody on this platform that wants to attend, that is not a member, we are going to send a number on the platform. PRO, Public Affairs Secretary, please send your number to everybody so that they can send you. Those that are not members that are on the platform now, so that we can send them the link. On uh, 1st of October 2, we are going to have digital marketing proper as part of our, all these, these two are part of our empowerment uh, lecture series. Now, on 4th of October, 
our regular monthly joint booster. That's the first Sunday in the month. We're going to have, uh, that will be a topical issue too, blasphemy in Islam. It's going to be in Yoruba, but we we'll attempt to summarize to non-Yorubas, non-Yoruba speaking audience by the time the lecturer completes his lecture. The, the name of the lecturer is Dr. Sirajuddin Bilal al -Asrao. Then suffice to say that we want those that are not members to know that we meet weekly, but now it's virtual because of the pandemic. We have our Uzra zones, that is weekly um, interactions that we do. We have them in Ikorodu. We have them in, we have in Ketu Ojota, Age Geogba, number four, Okwaba, number five, Alimosho, number six, Surulere, number seven, Akute. In all these places we meet, we used to meet virtual, physical, but it's now virtual because of the new normal. Now, we'll go to some of the comments that we have and um, equally the, uh, the, um, the questions. We wish to acknowledge the presence of Alaji Raza Kolaje Jo, uh, is here with us, the BOT chairman of uh, University of Lagos Muslim Alumni. May Allah continue to spare your life for us. Uh, I mean, then we have this comment from uh, one of our brother, Temple Ahmad. He said, I agree with you on the dormant account provisions. This is because it is not unlikely for the organization to fulfill its objective without necessarily having the need for bank transactions. So we have two questions now. As other questions come in, the lecturer, the speaker will take it. Speaker, please. Um, can I uh, read the two questions or one after the other? You can read the two questions, please. Okay. So the number one question that we have here is, are you saying the list of members should be open to the general public or only to the members of the association? Number two question, how does limited liability partnership differ from limited partnership? Those are the two questions that I want you to take. We'll check others as they come. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the questions. And um, before I answer the questions, I will say that um, uh, I'm a lawyer and we work with jurisdiction and powers and authority. So the scope, the scope of our discussion is on NGO and all that. So the person who asked that question can reach out privately. If, um, let our questions be limited to the NGOs here. Okay. So on that regard, question two is disqualified, whilst I'll take question one. So all yes. Right. Should, should the list of members be aware, open to members of the public or members of the organization? I will say that in Islam, I mean, I'm a Muslim, so I have to talk from Islam, Islamic perspective, aside from legal perspective. Part of the dictates of our religion is that, aside from speaking to convince people about your religion or to tell them about what your religion is all about, the best way for people to know about your religion or to appreciate your religion is based on your actions. So when they see your action, let them see that oh, this guy is behaving very well. I would like to be a Muslim because of his actions. So in that regard, what do we have to hide? Why, why should we hide our list of members? We are not a secret organization. If I see on the list of members that Mr. Abdul Majid Ghaniu is a member of this organization on the internet, and I'm not a member, just because I admire you alone, I can say that because Mr. Abdul Majid is a member of this organization, it means that this organization, they must know what they are doing. Therefore, I want to go and join this organization. So if we make our list of members to be open to members of the public, it will even help transparency. It will help promote our cause, promote our objective. So I think we should make it open to members of the, board of the organization and members of the public. Because if members of the public see those who are members, you see a chairman of a bank, and you see that he's a member of an organization, an Islamic organization, you'll be like, for this man, with all the money he has, with all the connection he has, he's also worshiping God. Then me too, I want to go, to, some people go to some churches or some mosques because they know that some people come there. And it's not, it's not a crime, it's allowed. Because when you worship somewhere, karma adhere. If one of your worshippers is not feeling fine, you that you have money, you can take care of him. That's why Islam preaches praying in Jamaat in the mosque. So we can associate because people are associating with something. So it helps us, it helps transparency. We don't have anything to hide. If it's a secret organization, then we can say, yes, we don't want people to know who our members are. But as an Islamic organization that we are preaching for businessmen and professionals, what do we have to hide? 
let us make it public and people will learn from us. Other organizations will learn from us and say, yeah, if the companion is doing this way, let me follow them regardless of the religion. So I think it's very important that we make it open and for transparency's sake, because we have to be transparent. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, we must be transparent. Anything we are doing, if they give you one naira, don't spend the money and put another one there. That same exact one naira note, make sure you keep it for the person. So let's be transparent in our affairs. And when we are transparent, we can complain about our government. But when we're not transparent in our own organizations, we're not complaining that the government is embezzling money. We don't have any moral justification. And perhaps that's the reason why God has not allowed Nigeria to be better than where it is now. Because in our own privacy, we are not following what we're supposed to be following. So let's be transparent. And if the companion starts this, other people will follow them. So I think it's important for us to make it open to members of the public. Okay, thank you for that. The questions that we have now, we have uh, three more questions, um, not in particular order anyway. Are the trustees required to sign off reports to CAC? Otherwise, how do they ensure enforce? That's okay. number one. Uh, there, there, there's another question, please. Okay. Or oh, you want to take that? Let me take it. Let me take it. Why? So I will... I'll, I'll be very short. I'll be very brief. Okay. So on that, like I said earlier, CAC, when you're transacting with CAC, CAC only knows the trustees. CAC does not know the Amir or the chairman. So any correspondence you are filing at CAC, there's always a column for chairman and for secretary. If there's another of the, of the, of the trustees, of the board of trustees, because there's a difference between chairman of the trustees and chairman of the organization. So if you are filing with CAC, it's the chairman of the trustees that will sign and the secretary of the trustees. But now if there's a new regulation saying that, okay, in addition to this, the administrative head should sign something, then we can know they should sign. So I think the why the person is asking that question is, if I'm signing something, what if there's error there? So as a, as a trustee, as a chairman signing, you have to ensure accuracy. So when they give you a report to sign, you look at it and ask questions before you append your signature. If you don't agree with what has been filed, then you make it, you put it official, you make it in writing that I can't sign this, go and clarify that. But the trustees, that's why the act makes reference to trustees. In filing accounts, it says the trustee shall, the trustee shall. It didn't say the Amir shall or the chairman shall. It said the trustees. So it is important the trustees will sign it. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Can a member of the BOT resign if the NGO does not abide by the Kama and after he has made all this, all that the speaker said we should do? Oh, of course, that's the right, that's the proper thing to do because if you don't resign and the organization is found wanting, they are, going to, they are going to blame you and they are going to sanction you. So you should resign. That's the honorable thing to do. And when you resign, make it public. Write a letter to the organization. Let the members know that I'm no longer on this organization. Because some people might have been aware that you are a trustee in the past and based on your trusteeship, they are still giving them money. So if you are aware of this kind of thing, I say, well, I used to be affiliated with you as a trustee. I'm no longer here. So I'm not taking any responsibility because it's just like the case of um, um, bank debtors. When banks were owing, um, people were owing banks companies were owing bank and they published the name in the newspaper. They went to publish the name of some directors that have resigned in the past. That's because when they resigned, they did not file it at CAC. So when you resign as CAC, when you resign as a trustee, ensure that the secretary of that organization files it at CAC. Because if you say you have resigned and it's not recognized in CAC, they will say your resignation is a fraudulent resignation. That is because you know that CAC was investigating them. That's why you went to go and backdate your resignation. So when you give it to your organization, let them acknowledge receipt of it and follow up that. Have you filed it in CAC? If you don't file it in CAC, you can take them up on it. So it's not just enough for you to resign. Apart from resigning, ensure you have an acknowledgement, acknowledged copy, and ensure that that document is filed in CAC. The resignation is referred in CAC because you have a lot of organizations, their direct, their trustees have resigned several years ago. But if you go and check um, Wikipedia or go and check CAC's register, it's the name of the founders that are still there. Meanwhile, some of them have even died. Some of them have even left. So we have a duty to ensure it is filed in CAC. And the proper thing for you to do when they are not following what you are telling them to follow is for them, for you to resign. Because as the trustee, you are superior to the geo, you are superior to the Amir, you are superior to the Imam. You are the one that is guiding the affairs of that organization and they must listen to you. Once they don't listen to you, then you should make sure you either opt out or you remove them from office. Yeah, before the next question, we have the following comments. Um, we all have to accept the responsibility for the shortcomings of the camera as currently amended. Though NGOs are to be politically seen as always being neutral, it is, however, the responsibility of everyone to be active, aware of democratic process in the nation, especially as regards to enactment or review of existing laws. 
it is the responsibility of everyone to to be part to be part of every law from the drafting to the final uh, signature of the executive. Another comment for Islamic organization, there may be need to train trustees on their roles because many do not know what is expected of them. Now we have the next question. Given the many and serious lacuna raised by the speaker, can we as a group? Well, this question is not that, that the this question is not directed at the at the speaker, it's directed at the company. So the company will answer this. Can we as a group, the company and NGO like declare posted that Nigeria is good to go as far the repeal of Kama law? Well, for me. These questions, we will answer it with our, because after this lecture, we're going to do a press release of what has transpired and our position on it. So this question now will be answered with that. The next question is, please, please, could you clarify on the frequency of filing return once a year or two times a year? But before that, uh, Barisa Farouk, I omit said one Uzra zone, and I've been reminded, we have another Uzra at Lighthouse, so Lekki. So anybody living in that as is, you have a place you can go or you can you come to. But anybody that wants to join any of our Uzra zone, just send your number. Uh, the Public Affairs Secretary, please post your number for them to send things to you. You can tell him what you want, then you will be able to respond to it. So please answer that question now. Okay, yes, thank you very much, Al. Um, before I answer the question, I just want to comment on the issue of participating in lawmaking. So what, this is very important because no law in Nigeria is made in secrecy. And it is only in Nigeria, if I'm not mistaken, that is when the, the us has voted, that you see people making noise and all that. At the appropriate time for us to make noise or for us to bring our inputs, a lot of people go to bed, then when the law is signed, and that can be, that can be traced to maybe two different things. Maybe the, because when they are making laws, they invite participation from members of the public. They ask organizations to make um, presentations and a lot of organizations make presentations. But maybe the, the channel of notifying members of the public is not wide enough. So a lot of people who want to contribute don't contribute because they are not aware that it's going on. But what organizations can do is that all organizations have legal advisors. They have, legal, they have a position for a legal advisor or secretary. You can monitor the proceedings at the National Assembly we all read newspapers. There's no law that is being made that you don't see it in the newspaper. They will tell you that they are in the first stage of the law. And when this law is in the first stage, then you find out when is public hearing going to be done. Or look for your representative. All of us here, we have members of the House of Rep or senators representing us. And their phone numbers are on, on the media. Their email addresses are on the media. We can write to them. And so we have a duty to participate. So when we have ideas, and as a matter of fact, I've participated in a lot of all these public hearings. And I can tell you that the National Assembly, they, they accept memorandum from members of the public. And if, you see, if they see a useful point, they take it on. So going forward, let us also try to be partic participating in all these things and um, we, can, we can always um, sort that out. So to answer your question, is it by annually or annually? So, okay, yeah. Section 845 of Kama says that the trustees of an association shall submit to the commission a biannual statement of affairs of the association as the commission shall specify in its regulation. So the idea now is that by annual, but as may be specified in the regulation. As of date, the regulation is yet to be issued. So once the regulation is issued, then we are going to know what the correct position is. But aside from that, aside from that, the primary position is that for you to file one return, and that is contained in section 848, which says that not earlier than 30th of June or later than 31st of December each year, apart from the year of incorporation, because if you incorporate an NGO or an association in this year, you are given one year not to file anything. So within, before 30th of June, not earlier than 30th of June or 31st of December, you must file to the commission a report, a return, showing the name of the association, the name and addresses and occupation of the trustees, members of the governing council, particulars of land held by the corporate body during the year, and, any, any, and of any change which has taken place in the constitution of the association during the preceding year. And the return referred to above shall be accompanied by the audited statement of account. So since a regulation has not been made by CAC, all you need to file now is a return once in a year, as stated in section 848, accompanied with your audit testament of account. But we have to be on the lookout for the regulation, because when the regulation is issued, 
then the regulation can now provide more details as to the biannual filings. But as of date, as of now, it's just a single returns with your auditor statement of account. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Uh, after a few weeks of CAC reg registration of an NGO, how do we start to report to Kama or also about the tax report? I hope you get this question. It's not clear to me. Is it clear to you? Yeah, I think I have an idea. I think I have an idea. I think what the person okay, is saying is that after registration of the NGO, how, should, how are we going to be able to comply with the provisions of Kama? So I need to make it very clear because I didn't address that during my presentation. The part of complying with provisions of Kama is that at the registration process, don't just get someone who will do copy and paste constitution for you. Copy and paste documents. There are some items in your constitution because a lot of organizations, associations are having problems. Like I mentioned, in the estate where I live, they are having problems. In my office, they are having problems. Different ones, the consultants, they are having problems. And what causes this problem is that some of them, their constitution was just done copy and paste. No thorough debate or thought process was given to the constitution making provision. So that when you now have an organization, you see that some chairman or presidents are even claiming to be superior to the board of trustees. They don't take advice from the board of trustees. Meanwhile, the board of trustee is supposed to be superior. So part of the way of complying with Kama is when you are drafting your constitution, don't just follow the templates. Don't just do copy and paste someone that does copy and paste for you. Get someone that can address key issues in your constitution. Because in, 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 in litigation, what we say in litigation is that cases are lost in the office, in the law firm, not in the court. So a case that will have been lost is when they are drafting the processes that they will have lost the case. So an NGO that will be able to comply with the provisions of Kama, it is at the incorporation stage. Don't just say, hey, I mommy, we'll see at the sister and that, that, that is trust, as the trustees. No, appoint credible people and draft your constitution in a way that makes the duties very clear on how you can remove the chairman, how you can remove the trustees, how you can comply with the rules. So you have that, then the secretary knows that, okay, our constitution is very clear. So when you have the NGO now, the, NGO, the secretary just says, that, okay, this is what our constitution says. Let us file our returns or let us, our legal advisor, let him do all these things for us. So it's very important. Some of all these organizations in the UK, the Charities Commission, once you spend about 25,000 pounds in a year on a monthly basis, you have to file returns regularly that, okay, we have spent above this amount of money. This is what we spend this money on. So you have to get an accountant. You can't say you're an organization and you don't have an accountant because CAC wants to know where did you get your money from? Are you getting money from Iran, from Russia, from some individuals? Let us see where the money is coming from. How much have you spent? If you, some people got 10 million naira and they spend 9 million naira on administrative expenses. That's fraud. That's pure fraud. So the corporate governance procedures must be followed. And this can only be followed from the incorporation stage. Once you miss it at the incorporation stage, it will be very difficult for you to, for you to succeed at the post-incorporation stage because the damage will have been done to the foundation. So to answer your question, follow your constitution, follow the law, get your legal advisor to advise you because some NGOs are bigger than some companies. In the UK now, people are advocating that the chairman of some NGOs should earn as much as the chairman of some banks or MD of some banks because some NGOs are so big that the actions they carry out is so huge that it should be well paid than like directors of banks. So NGO business or, or association business is big business. Don't just say we are a group of Muslims and because we are just contributing money on Friday. No, you should look ahead. You can become global. You can become international. You can raise your funds and you can have serious impact nationwide. So it's, it's big business and it shouldn't be taken with levity. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Is it everything uh, apart from the audited account constitution list of member be filed? What the person, I think, what is trying to say that uh, should they file the uh, audited account constitution list of my or list of members? Is it part of the thing that should be filed? No, what should be filed? What should be filed in section 848? Apart from the audited reports, it now says you file a return comprising the names, addresses, and occupation of trustees and the members of the council or governing body. Not, not list of members. You must file because if your trustees have changed, if you let's say in January now you remove Alaji Abdul Majid as a trustee. If you are filing for next year, you have to write it then that we have removed Alaji Abu Fatah Abdul Majid and we have introduced Alaji Abu Ghani Abdul Majid as a new trustee. So they want to know the occupation. Your trustee, is he, does he have a job? Is he a lecturer or is he jobless? Where does he live? Can we trace his address? Because it's the trustees they want to deal with. Then the list of the governing council, because all these NGOs, are seen, they have the governing council and most of them, their governing council members are different from their board of trustees. So they want to have the address and names of all these bodies. So whenever they find out that this organization has breached any law, they know who to go and grab. So it's not the list of members, list of association 
and list of um, 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 list of um, ESCO and list of trustees. And I think there's a, there was a question about the membership saying that is it okay to make the members of members of the organization public? That what if I don't want member people to know that I'm in an organization? I don't okay. see any reason why, why, you, why I don't why see anything why you wouldn't want people to know you're from an organization. If I'm a Muslim now and I join companion, why should I want to hide my membership? If I'm a Christian and I join Deeper Life, why should I want to hide my membership? Or if I'm a member of the Koei Club, why would I want to hide? You, you, you join it voluntarily. So if you are not, anything you are not is in Islam, what you cannot do in private, don't do it in public. So if you are not proud of your membership of the organization, don't join in the first place. So members of organization, they will tell you I'm an Obomi member and they are proud of their membership and you see them wearing white beads. They are proud of their membership. So if members of organizations are proud of their membership, you should be proud. If you are not proud, then resign and don't join. But I don't think because you don't want people to know you are. If you don't want people to know you are there, then don't join. So we have three more questions and I don't want people to send any further question because we want to end by 10.30, inshallah. We are 10.21 now. So the speaker will at attempt at uh, answers all the questions. The next one is, do we need the approval of BOT in, on spending irrespective of the project or amount of fund? You get me? Yes, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a brilliant question. And I want to talk, I want to, before I answer that question, I will want to say something. Okay, yeah. So when you talk about incorporated trustees, what do members of the public expect of an incorporated trustee? They are, based on research that has been done worldwide, there are five critical elements that members of the public want in an incorporated trustee. And I will go through them. Number one is that, that a high proportion of the money the association raises goes to those it is trying to help and not on administrative costs. That's number one. Number two, that it operates to high ethical standards. Number three, that it is making impact in the society. Number four, that it is well run. Number five, that it is doing work that the governments, both at the central and local level, are not doing or cannot do because they are overwhelmed. So if an ESCO wants to spend money, if it's trivial expense, like you want to pay for diesel of generator, you want to buy a um, salary of Gateman, those are minor things that you shouldn't disturb the BOT. But every organization should have a budget. So you shouldn't be disturbing BOT members because BOT members are very busy. But when you don't have a budget, then you want to spend money, you are calling BOT member every day, it doesn't, for good, for corporate governance, it doesn't make any sense. But if you have a budget, then the, the president of the organization knows that, okay, we have a budget. Is it in our budget? Do we have enough income? Let us follow it. But when you don't have a budget, and maybe because you don't have enough money, you don't have time to do the budget, before you make any major expense, you must come out and get the approval of the NGO, of the board of trustees. Because if you don't have the, the approval of the board of trustees, the president can spend the money on official car for himself and say, we are buying an official car for the ESCO members, we are paying for hotel. They are paying for this. So you see that they will be spending more money on administrative costs than on jihad or than on Islam. So that's where the BOT is required to act as a check and balance to the executive council. So it is very important if the organization has 10 million naira in its account and the president wants to spend 6 million or 5 million or 3 million and you don't want to talk to the BOT. I mean, that's, that's, that's lack of um, ethics. That means you're not running it ethically. So you must get approval. And if you know that the BOT are busy, then do a budget. BOT, this year I want to spend 3 million, but I'm going to raise 7 million. Then you debate it. When you agree on it, then you'll be on autopilot. So let's learn how to do things the proper way. So the BOT is very important. Don't sideline them. They are not just when, there is, when you are fighting for election, that's when you go and remember the BOT. No, they must be involved because if any problem happens against that association, it's the, it's the trustees that will be held responsible, not the Amir or the Afar that is spending the money. So we have to, we have to carry them along. Okay. And we have to make our constitution very clear on that. If our constitution has subsumed the role of BOT under the role of um, the ESCO, then you go and redraft that constitution and make this trustee superior to the, to the, to the ESCO. Okay, we uh, will have an announcement now. We wish to acknowledge the presence of the criteria of members uh, with us. Initially, this lecture was supposed to be internal, companion and criterion. But later, when we decided to make it public, we forgot to inform them. So we apologize that we're not doing it public, but we acknowledge the presence of the Criterion members on the platform. Then equally, the Criterion, they will be having a program on um, Muslim women in leadership position on the 20th of September, 10 a.m. Uh, 
and it will, the, the, I will post the contact person now for everybody to see for, the criteria is basically a female organization, right? The companion is basically a male organization. And most of our wives are in the criteria, although there are some people that are not our wives that are not that are in, the, that are in the criteria. Same for the companion. Most of the husbands are of the criteria in companion, but there are some that are not husbands of the criteria. So I'll post the number for female that want to attend that program that you can contact. So we'll go to the next um, uh, next next um, question. Uh, the next question is just give me some time, please, so that I can scroll down. Is please, what are the criteria for determining which religious organization should file return? Okay, thank you for that question. You, you know, Kama does not make it mandatory for religious organizations to to register with CAC. So what it simply means is that if you are a RATB, quote and unquote, RATB organization that you are not registered with CAC, you don't need to file any returns. But the advantage of registering with CAC is that when you register with CAC, members of the public will have confidence in you to say, okay, you are registered, we can give you money. So once you are registered, automatically you must file, regardless of your creed. Once you are registered with CAC, you must file all religious organizations that are registered. But if you are not registered with CAC, there's no duty or obligation for you to, to, to file returns with CAC. But once you are registered, whether you are a Muslim or you are a Christian or you are a traditional um, religious organization, you must file your returns with CAC. And if you don't want to file, you deregister, you liquidate yourself. I didn't mention that under the under in my presentation. As an organization, you can also apply to the courts for you to be wound up, for the uh, for the association to be for, to be dissolved. So if all your members, you say that okay, we have achieved our objectives, you can go to courts, and 50% of the members or any of the trustee can go to court and say the courts should dissolve this. NGO because we have achieved our objective or our objective has become illegal or we no longer want to proceed and all that. So that's a procedure. All organizations that are registered must comply with the law by filing their returns. Okay, last question. Um, I can see that uh, Barista Abdul Hamid Wa Abdul Karim is in the house. If he has anything to say, he should let me know. If not, we'll close the session after the um, after the, this last question. The last question is, if one association joins with other with similar objectives and the conglomerate does not perform as well as the individual organization, what can the one who feels this way do? What, uh, what the person, I want to add to the question, can they now separate? You know, the question that the person asks is, what can the organization who feel that they are not performing as they used to do? I'm like, can they still go back their individual ways? I hope you get it. Yeah, I understand the question. Thank you for that question. So before I answer the question, I'll just give you an analogy because, you know, I have a, a minor interest in politics. When APC was formed, a lot of parties came together to form APC. And once you form a party, automatically the other parties, their certificate of incorporation or registration will be deleted, will be torn. So they are no longer existing under the law. So you can't revert to that old position. So just like happens to, unless the law says that after you have um, joined together, you can also come apart. And the section on karma that says associations can come together, unfortunately does not have any provision on a divorce or you coming back. So you're back into your old position. So before you collaborate or merge, you must have discussed everything and ensure that, um, because you change your name, you will change members of the board of trustees. So the moment you become one, you can't say APC faction, CPC faction, AC faction. All these ones does not exist anymore. Once Ansar Rudin and Anwar Islam come together, then we are all one. It's not, um, you can't, you can't if you, unless you want to wind it up, but you can't separate by saying you want to revert to the old one. Because what happens is that when you merge, the, the CAC will delete the name in the register. They will ask you for your old certificate of incorporation. So let's say um, Farouk Abbas Association and um, Abdul Ghani Majid wants to come together. If we are coming together, we will say both of us have agreed to use Abdul Majid's name or want to form a new name. If you want to form a new name, CAC will ask Farouk Abbas and Abu Ghani Abu Majid to submit their old incorporation certificates. When they collect it from us, they will destroy it. They will not give us a new one. So even if you want to revert, we don't have anything to revert to because CAC has withdrawn it from us. So the idea of merger is make sure you discuss all the issues that can give you problem, discuss it, consult your lawyer to tell you that, okay, these are, the, these are, these are, these are trigger points, these are red flags, these are issues you should discuss. When you discuss all that, some companies, when they are merging, they discuss for almost two, three years. So association, when we are doing that now, it might take you six months. 
for you to agree, okay, who will produce the, the, the GEO, the general overseer, who will produce financial director, you have to discuss it. Because once you come together, you can't go apart unless you wind up. Okay. I would, uh, like I said, I said I want to post the criterion contact. I've posted the number. The number is uh, Sister Kaka making mistake. I want to post them all. Well, uh, there is a person that asked for the, um, the speaker's number. Can I give it to him privately or you want to contact him yourself, speaker? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Someone on the platform, uh, Mr. Tunde Salau, requested for your number. So, oh, please feel, feel, please feel free to share my number, my email address. It's available okay. on, on the internet. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I can give it to everybody, Abby? Yes, please. Okay, I'll do that now. Uh, I'm going to share his number. I'm going to post his number on the, words, well, the chat room. And I'm... Um, Equally acknowledging the presence of a member of NOSFAT, I guess one of the ESCO of NOSFAT. Uh, we thank Allah for his mercies that uh, we planned this uh, lecture series and it came to fruition. We pray to Allah to give uh, Barista Farouk Abbas long life, give him good health, give him more capacity to do much more than what he has already done. May Allah continue to be with his family and be with every one of us. May what we have had this morning benefit everybody. So I'll post the number before we go, before we do our closing dua. Now, just the number you are going to see is this number 0803 358 8693. So his number is 003-358-8693. So it's posted. So Mr. Sule Salau, uh, Mr. Bayo, Shilere, you are welcome. All our, everybody on the platform, both Muslim and non-Muslim, we hope when we invite you for another session, we'll continue to do this session, whereby we intervene in terms of things that has to do with government policies and things that affect uh, the lives of common person. May Allah continue to be with us. Subhanaka Allah and Bika, Shah Allah to the Subhanahu Rabbi Bika, Rabbi Rizati Ammaya Sifun wa Salaam ala al Murza, and Alhamdulillah Rabbi Alameen. Thank you.